Hey guys, thank you. It was very nice. So if you had, for those that do or don't have mentors, I highly recommend it. And I've been very, very lucky to have one mentor. His name's Harry Rosen. Is anybody from Canada? Anyone? I can't really see. There's like half of one. Okay. Um, so we have this, uh, an amazing retailer called Harry Rosen. And Harry himself, oh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Harry himself is in his 80s, and I got, I've been very, very fortunate to know him for, for a number of years. And I remember him telling me the story about his uncle. See, his uncle had uh, a salmon store uh, in Kensington Market, this kind of fish market area, just kind of in the eastern part, I think western part of Toronto. And it was one of these fish markets where he'd, he'd sell all his salmon, but if you look, there was, you know, 15 stores right beside him, all selling the exact same thing, all selling salmon. And every day, no matter what, rain or shine, fall, winter, spring, he would sell all his salmon. Sold out, every single one of them. And he had all the, all the store owners down the street always looking down at Harry's uncle being like, how in the world? I always got fish left, he's always selling every single one of his. And Harry's uncle was very proud, obviously. He thought there was something unique. He, he had a lot of pride in, in the salmon he was selling and the way he was selling and the way he was teaching, his, uh, uh, kind of talking to his customers. But every day, no matter what, he sold all his salmon. But this one day, I think it was spring or fall, I don't remember exactly, and uh, it was about 4.55, store closed around five o'clock, so this is around 1950s, 1960s, and he's got his salmon left. And he's like, all right, today's the day, you know, I had a good streak, had a good run, and, you, and all the other guys down the street are like, they're just happy, right? Like, oh yeah, finally, he didn't sell anything. They think he's gonna go bankrupt, you know, because it, it didn't happen the way he wanted. So Harry's uncle says, yeah, okay, well, it is what it is. 4.59 comes, and it's one of those old traditional doors, you know, with the little bell at the top you see sometimes in movies these days. And a woman walks in, and Harry's uncle's like, yes, I'm going to sell all my salmon. And all the other guys are like, shit. <laughs> you know, like, that sucks. See, but Harry's uncle was an amazing marketer. Part of what he did so well is he never made that customer feel like they were just buying salmon. And he never wanted this one woman to feel like she was buying his last salmon of the day or his only salmon, right? Because you don't know what's left. So she comes in and says, I want your finest salmon. And so he makes a big production of it. He says, you want my finest sa salmon? No problem at all. So he kind of makes this big production of it as he's like swimming with his hand. There's only one fish. It's not hard to catch it. He's just swimming and swimming, takes it out, puts it on the scale, says four pounds, five ounces. What a beauty. She says, do you have anything bigger? Do you have anything bigger? He's only got one fish. This is all he's got. <laughs> so he takes that same fish, throws it back in the water, <laughs> puts his hand around and around and around, and with his thumb on the scale and the fish, six pounds, two ounces. What a beauty. She says, great, I'll take both. <laughs> but see, the brilliant marketer that he was never wanted his customer to feel like they were getting his last fish or that they were his best and only customer. And he says, sorry, ma'am, you know our policy, one fish per customer. And what I love about that story is, that's Harry's uncle. Commitment means something different to everybody. To Harry's uncle, it was committing to making that customer feel like she was the only customer that he needed to take care of at that moment, that that fish was just for her. Commitment to you might mean something totally different in a number of different ways. Commitment to me means the opportunities that are in front of me do I exhibit the commitment that I think I have in front of it. So in the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. And, and hopefully take you on a ride. So if you're looking at a map of the world, kind of you got North America here, you got, uh, I'm gonna do my geography a second, China here, Russia. Um, my dad was born in Uzbekistan, grew up in Ukraine. Uh, my mom was actually, <laughs> my grandfather was thrown into Siberia. Um, my mom was born in Siberia. Eventually she, she moved to Latvia, that's where they live. Uh, my parents meet along the way, they get married in Latvia. My brother's born in Latvia, they moved to Israel, I'm born in Israel. We come to Canada in 1980, and the joke for the longest time was the only one that was truly Canadian was our dog. <laughs> and so 1980, we come. My parents are amazing engineers, um, but if for any of you that are immigrants or have immigrant parents, you know being an immigrant is the hardest thing in the world. You may be more educated than most people in your kind of area, but you don't speak the language, you don't fit. And so my parents struggled, struggled deeply. You know, they couldn't find jobs. My mom was the breadwinner for a while. She worked for an airplane manufacturer called De Havilland. My dad worked at pawn shops. But over time, they saved up a little bit of cash. 
They opened up a furniture store. That furniture store did well over time. They had a few of them. My parents were not quote unquote rich, but they did well for themselves. They employed dozens of people over the years. It allowed me to kind of have a roof over my head, have food, go to a good school. And around when I was 17, I had just started my first year of university. Um, I didn't know what to do. So this is 1996, 1997. Internet's not really what it is today. I don't even know what it was then. Um, but I found some creepy guy on the internet and I, in Belize, and I said, hey, uh, any chance I can come uh, live with you in the jungle? He's like, yeah, sure, come on, come on, come on down. <laughs> sure. You know? So, uh, you know, I walkie-talkied him, and I walkie-talkied him home, and I said, all right, I'm going to do this. So I lived in the, the jungle of the savannah for a little bit and built tree nurseries and got bit by Billum, which are basically mini piranhas. I was, I was being Tarzan. I was just having fun, and I, I was seeing what's going on in, in, kind of in this era. And something really got, got me going. Is I said, there's something really here. Now, Belize has evolved over time, but I was in Belmopan, which was a little bit different of an area. And so then I go in and continue my undergrad, and I studied in Singapore through it. I, I worked uh, as an internship for MTV Asia for a little bit, and then I traveled around that area. Came back home. I just wasn't really sure what I was going to do. Uh, you know, I kind of had these moments in time. Uh, I decided to do my GMATs for a MBA school, but I'm not ready to go do my MBA, and I take off for a year for Latin America. Go back to Belize and, and see my creepy friend. Uh, you know, I go down you know, in Costa Rica, I go down Ecuador. Eventually, I get my way all the way to Argentina, and Argentina was a really big fear for me. And the fear there was, I'm a poor traveler traveling around South America. I'm going to run out of money eventually. I think when we ran out of money in Chile, we started selling like sandwiches. I think it was vegan sandwiches to like the local gay community in, in San Diego. Like we were trying to be as creative as we could and figure out how to get by. And the only reason we sold vegan is because I couldn't afford to pay for meat. So, <laughs> so it's not that we were being socially responsible. But I get into Argentina, and it's in the middle of the economic collapse. The peso has just been demoralized, and every day the value of the peso is dropping further and further and further. And I'll never forget this scene that I'm in the middle of Buenos Aires, and there are these beautifully dressed professional workers. In one hand, they have a spoon. In another hand, they have a fork. And they're banging on the bank's doors, saying, give me my money that I worked so hard to get. Give me back my money. And basically, the currencies were falling so quick, the banks literally had to shut down the doors because they, they, nobody knew what to do and how to, how to handle it. And here I was, this poor, American tra poor Canadian traveler with American dollars. And I basically formed my own little black market in the street. So I started selling US dollars to these people that basically would have done anything for dollars. And whether it was good or bad, I could take that. <laughs> okay, it's fine. Uh, whether it was good or bad, that was an opportunity I had in my, in my, uh, at the time. And I took it, and, and I used it to my advantage. And I got to travel for another <laughs> many months because of it. So I kind of had that at the back of my head, kind of jumping around. Later on, I go do, go do my MBA, and I'm struggling. I don't feel like I'm your typical MBA. And so out of it, I launched a charity called MBAs Without Borders, where we would build small businesses in Africa, Asia, Latin America. We worked in Haiti, Afghanistan, Colombia. Uh, we worked in India with a couple of hospitals in uh, Tamil Nadu and some other areas. And eventually, I make my way to Liberia. So I'm in Liberia in Western Africa. And we were helping uh, some rubber farmers and doing some projects there. And I always love seeing what's going on in the local business. And so I meet this, basically this farm, uh, farmer. I meet this, similar to Harry's uncle, you know, one of these stalls, I see them. This guy's selling shoes, actually sandals. And I look, and there's another 15 guys selling the exact same thing. I don't know, has anybody ever traveled a little bit around the world? You find this, like, great stall, and you see, like, a basket you've never seen. Oh, my God, this is the greatest thing. And then you look, and there's, like, 50 guys selling the exact same thing, right? <laughs> so it's exactly what happened with the sandals. So I, I say to him, I go, I'm just curious. I go, I'm a cute little, yeah, it's a nice sandal. Good enough. I said, uh, how's business? And I'll never forget, you know, he was black, dark skin, um, and he had these bloodshot eyes. And he just looks at me with just, you know, just the fear uh, or anger. And he's like, how's business? He goes, I can sell my shoes. They're a dollar. The poorest of the poor here will pay for my shoes. They're good quality. They, they're no problem. But everybody knows the white man's coming next week with his charity to give away his shoes. And this is before Tom's became Tom's, because there's, there's many charities like this, so it's not Tom's. He goes, and when they come, no one buys my shoes for weeks. He's like, how do I compete with free? And I was, for, that phrase just stuck in my head, and he's so right. So I see all this rubber in Liberia, and I think, okay, you know what? Liberia, Liberté, I'm a proud Canadian, O Canada, O Liberté, that's how the name forms. And I say, okay, I'm going to build a shoe factory, or what is of a shoe factory here in Liberia, 
making shoes made in Africa, selling it around the world. At that time, the charity that I had, you can't own a charity, but I personally own the trademarks. I sold those trademarks to a charity out of the US, and I take that money, it wasn't a lot, it was like $30,000, and I buy this custom-made machinery. I had a partner in Liberia, Roger, and he was gonna help build, basically, uh, my rubber factory for this shoe company that I was, didn't know what I was gonna do or how I was gonna do it. Take six months to clear customs. I get a call from Francine, Roger's wife, and she says, I have some bad news. Roger's got malaria, and he's died. My whole business plan was based on Roger being a big part of this business. And so I say that sucks, obviously, for many reasons. I go over to Liberia, I pay my condolences, and I go to check on my machinery and figure out what my next step's gonna be, and all my machinery is stripped, stolen, gone, missing, there's nothing left. So I just got married at this time, and I have a still very understanding wife, and I say to her, <laughs> uh, so, I don't know, you know, I'm not giving up. My parents came to this country in their mid-30s, late 30s, didn't speak the language, they figured out, you gotta believe in me. She says, I, I kinda signed a contract, I guess I do have to believe in you. <laughs> um, so for now, I'll keep believing in you. And so I start hearing about Ethiopia, how they have this domestic manufacturing, they make shoes, only country in Africa that could compete against Chinese imports, and I say, okay, there's something here. I go all the way over to Ethiopia, and a guy that worked for me in Colombia with MBAs Without Borders starts visiting the tanneries and factories. And so we start. We make the first premium footwear brand made in sub-Saharan Africa, sold around the world, and we're starting. Quality sucks. Everything's late. Nothing's working. I can't get investors behind me. And I can't get investors behind me for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're like, Tal, you know nothing about shoes. <laughs> Two, it's Africa and people have their stereotypes. And three, this is in 2009 when the Great Recession started. So even the people that I knew that maybe had a little bit of cash were struggling. And four, eh, just sometimes people just don't believe in the idea. And so I said, okay, I tell my wife, I say, Kathy, I believe in it. You obviously don't believe in it, but we're together, so let's do this. Um, <laughs> and that house that we signed together, I need to use part of that, the line of credits, I need you to sign this. Don't worry what you're signing, just I'll take care of it. And and we go all in. I'm like, if I can just show people that people want to buy these shoes, investors will start running. So we start opening doors. We start opening, you know, Aldo and Town Shoes, and we get stores. And I go to the investors and I say, I got stores, I got customers. And they say, eh, we're still not interested, right? Then they say, get, get some more stores. I get more stores and they say, eh, eh, keep going. We'll see how this goes. So this happens for the first two or three years. But one of the big things that was happening is we were trying to sell a social mission. That we were really creating jobs in Africa and changing the way people see sub-Saharan Africa. But I really wasn't. I was just making shoes in a third party factory. So we decided in 2012 when we finally did raise some capital with some amazing investors that, that came on board early on to build a small factory in Addis Ababa in the capital. Today that factory has 110 workers. Following year we become fair trade certified and we're the only fair trade certified shoe factory then and still are today and I can talk to you about why we're the only one later on if, if you have questions. And we keep growing and we're figuring this out and sales are growing and then we start realizing something else is changing. We're this socially minded brand, you know, we brought on investors, we're trying to grow, we're trying, you know, a couple companies have tried to buy us. There's something here clearly, we're, we're starting to make something happen. But we're starting to realize, and I'm starting to see retail's changing, and you guys are all seeing it in front of you. Amazon becoming dominant, stores are closing. We can't get the sell through that we need, and if we can't figure this out, we're gonna be out of business real soon. So I go to the board about three years ago, and I say, we need to exit wholesale. Wholesale is when we sell to, let's say, a store like Nordstrom, and then they sell to you as a customer, for those that don't know. Direct is when we sell direct to you on our website or if we have our own store. And I basically say, we need to figure this out. And so we decided to leave wholesale completely, and that was 80% of our business. And so we basically said goodbye to that overnight, and in a year, we replaced every single dollar. Going direct, we pretty much saved the business and the trajectory of the business. We start growing, we start focusing on direct, because we can start talking one-on-one -on -one with our customer. It doesn't work for every business, but it worked for ours. And so we remain, I remain committed to obviously what I was doing. And so we grow into this direct-to-consumer brand, which we are today, where we can tell our story, we can be committed to the story that we want and not have to sacrifice ourselves for others. Now you sacrifice in other ways, but we remain committed to the end goal, which is taking care of our people, our factory workers, taking care of the product, making the best handcrafted products that we can in Ethiopia at the highest level of quality, using the highest materials that we can, we remain committed to being socially minded, so we're fair trade certified, and I can talk about 
kind of what the, that means. We're B Corp, we, I think we're the, one of the best scored B Corps in kind of the apparel, um, and we're part of 1% for the planet, where 1% of our gross sales goes to kind of initiatives that we do, and that ties into some of our fair trade. And so this continues to evolve, and we continue to evolve. And so as I start thinking about all those different moments in time when we could have paused or changed or changed courses, there's a lot of things that have happened along the way where you know, we had to address or change. The thing that always remained really interesting to me is I'm tied to the business. I mean, we've, we ne I never gave up. My investors never gave up, luckily. Um, but it wasn't easy. So perfect example is about four years ago, and I know people have credit cards and have loans and student loans. We all have them. But I didn't want to give up on my business. So I found a lender who was the only one at the time willing to give me capital, and he charged me 42% interest. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> Then I found a really good lender who only charged me 26% interest. And then I found another one that charged me 18% interest. And we're not talking like $50,000. These are like half a million, 600,000. I think we had a mil, uh, 700,000 facility at 26%. These were like insanely expensive. And I can only do them in certain states because certain states had usury laws that didn't allow you to go more. But these guys maxed it. But we always paid because I believed in it. And somehow we figured it out. And I was committed to the end goal, and I'm always committed to the end goal. And I always joke that me and Bill Gates, or now I guess Jeff Bezos, we always have one thing in common. When we're dead, we're just gonna be, we're gonna be just as rich and just as poor. So I'm committed to making the most out of the life I have today to my family. I have four little boys, Owen seven, Joe five, Levi's three, Knox is one, to my wife, to my family extended, which is the 110 workers that we have in Ethiopia. And so I challenge you, what is commitment? Uh, anybody ever seen Evan Almighty? And I'll end on this note. Evan Almighty, okay, I got kids, so I watch a, a lot of the same movie on Netflix over and over again. Um, Evan Almighty, Morgan Freeman's character is, is quote unquote God, and he says to um, Steve Carell's character, uh, sorry, Steve Carell's wife's character, because she's struggling with what this is, you know, this new Noah, who, you know, Steve Carell's character, I'm, I'm ruining the movie for some of you, but <laughs> Steve Carell's character becomes Noah, and he doesn't know how to handle it, and his wife is really struggling. And so Morgan Freeman, quote unquote, God, says, what is patience? And he talks about patience. But for me, I'm gonna change that word with, what is commitment? You don't have or not have commitment. Life presents opportunities to you where you can choose to be committed or not committed. And so I challenge you, let those opportunities come in front of you and decide whether you feel you wanna be committed or not committed. And for us, at Oliberté, commitment really stems under one thing. We have a phrase that we talk about in the office, I talk about in Ethiopia, and I'll leave you with this, and you probably heard something similar in different lines. That today is only the same day as yesterday if we do nothing about tomorrow. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much, Tao, for that talk. Step on up front, we'll do a little Q&A with the audience. Sure. So be thinking of questions that you might have for Tao. I kinda wanna start off with like, knowing what you know now, and starting your business, and being socially conscious, and all these things, what would you go back and tell your younger self as you were getting started, how to stay committed? What would you do differently, or what would you try? Don't do it. <laughs> No, you know, I, I was talking about this actually with somebody a few minutes ago before the talk. You know, if I have regrets, it's not that I have regrets, it's timing says everything. If I would start Au Liberté today, I would never have gone to wholesale. If I was starting a shoe brand today or any apparel brand, I'd go 100% direct to consumer, leverage every dollar you can into your own website and your own marketing initiatives. But when I started nine years ago, that, that infrastructure wasn't there. So that probably wouldn't have been the most, you know, mindful of it. For me, it's what does being socially minded mean? So here are my parents that had a furniture business. They sold furniture to put food on the table. To me, they're just as socially minded as I am. They took care of a dozen or two dozen lives. They put food on the table for those people. So what makes me more socially minded than let's say my parents? So if I would tell anything to my young self is stay true to your core, um, but know that it's not just you, you have factory workers, you have customers, potentially you have investors, and when you bring them on or hire them on, make sure you align together, and fortunately, I've been able to do that. 
Great. What questions might you have out here in the audience? I'll try to run the mic to you. We'll go up here up front. Hi, I'm Ray. Uh, not necessarily monetarily, but what were some of the most, what was the most expensive mistake you made along the way? Uh, thanks, Ray. Ray? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it, it was probably to do with materials. So um, in Ethiopia, because it's a landlocked country, we're not like in Asia or even the US, or here in Kentucky where if I need thread or I need glue, I can go around the corner and find a supplier. We got to pick and choose some of the suppliers that we have. And so, you know, early on especially, you know, I wish we probably picked better suppliers that provided a higher level of quality, even though it was maybe a little bit more expensive. And it's not that we went for cheap, it's just it was a thing, you know, for non-monetarily, even though it's tied a little bit, but your product, in my case, my product is number one. The social story is great, but if you can't sell the product, that all, all that other stuff is just tree hugging crap, right? Like, you know, you you really you really got to sell product first. And so, you know, early on, and it's a continuous thing. You know, I, I, our stuff is 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 handcrafted. It's great product. It's always getting better. But I would make sure that, in, 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 from a mistake perspective, that we picked uh, better raw material suppliers, in, at least in the earlier days. And we fixed that over time. But that would have been one of the things that was probably pretty important. Other questions? Are those your shoes? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> a little disappointed in Radical Capital right now, but that's a whole other story. Oh, thank you, half of Radical Capital. <laughs> hey, Tal, I'm Trisha. Thanks for being Hi, here. Uh, so you talked a lot about past and history and getting to where you are. What are you most geeked about for the future? Like, what are you just over the moon excited about for what's next? I'm most excited for when I build Au Liberté to the point when one of these guys who tries to buy us, one of these companies, has no other option but to keep the factory in place. That's my biggest fear. I mean, we will sell at some point. And my biggest fear is they will take the fact, they will say, great idea. It's, how, it's what happened to Uggs, for those that don't know. Uggs was a $10 million company. Deckers buys it. Everything's made in Australia. Decker says, we love what you've done, but we can't scale in Australia. They move everything over to China except a very, very small part of the line. And obviously, Uggs is now you know a, a, over a billion dollar in, sa in net sales company. So. It's not my biggest fear, but that's, so it's my thing I get geeked out more is, is how do I build enough infrastructure and such a brand that Ethiopia, even if it's a small part, is such an, so tied that I never have to go to those workers and say, hey guys, sorry, we're out, you know, enjoy your life. That's what I get geeked out for, and it's kind of a negative thing, but that's for me, is that's sustainability, is making sure I don't have to tell the work. I, whenever we hire someone, the reason my investors know, my board knows is, like, I'm very, they would love me to hire more people. I always say no, and it's because my biggest fear is telling somebody who's good, I don't have enough money to pay you, or we've chosen a different path. And so that's, an, that's what I get. Being big enough that I don't have to just hire because it's cool to have more people, but being big enough that these people get to have jobs if they want for the rest of their lives. Other questions? I'm now moved around. This is getting fun. All right, over here. This is going to be tricky. <laughs> Hey, I'm Natalia. I have a question. Uh, as far as like now that you've grown into a bigger company, how do you make sure that that commitment gets sort of you know passed through to your upper level management all the way down to you know your factory workers and everyone? Yeah. So great, great question. I mean, we're big, but we're not like, that big of a company yet. So we still can. I get to have at least a good amount of influence on that. The challenge is, is we said I said I wanted to be fair trade certified. And I go to Ethiopia, my GM said, hey, we want to be fair trade certified. He's like, oh my goodness, another one of your Western, like, oh, like things, you know? Like, <laughs> drove him nuts. He's like, what, they're gonna come here and tell me my chair's dirty? Like, what, like, it, so it was that, that is what continuously has to uh, stay, no matter how small or big we are. And when they, when our factory workers, the most important, I'm gonna digress a bit. One of the most amazing days I had was, we were at the factory, we had this, um, fair trade uh, consultant coming in explaining to the workers why we're doing fair trade. This is before we became fair trade certified. And there was a work, I think we had 60 workers in this kind of small canteen that we have. And it's all in Amharic, the local language. And there's a lot of yelling going on. The, the, the guy at the front, Freo is my general manager. He's sitting here with me 
he's not allowed to be part of this conversation because we can't be showing that we're forcing this or influencing. It's a part of one thing. And uh, the guy in the front, he keeps talking about what fair trade is. And then one of, we don't, we don't have a lot of older people because well, when I say we create 110 jobs, I mean we create 110 jobs. I'd never wanted us to create a factory and then just take the best workers from other factories and bring them to ours. For me, that's just displacing workers. We literally have brought people that were, are, are, are legally of age and brought them into the tax system. So that was an important thing. But we do have a couple senior people. So this talk is going on for five minutes and two of our older gentlemen are just like yelling and I don't even know what's going on. They're upset, they're like, I don't, it looks like they're upset. I, I, I don't know what is, I'm like, this is the worst idea I thought of, forget about fair trade, you know, they're done. So then I watch Freo get up and he says something to all the workers because he was not supposed to get up and then two seconds later they all look at me and they all start clapping. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so I say Freo afterwards, sorry, I didn't mean to swear, it's a Canadian thing. Um, <laughs> I go, I afterwards, I go, what just happened? He goes, the guy from the non because one of the things we have to do is fair trade, US, uh, being fair trade certified is we have to allow the workers to form a union. And so the two older gentlemen, because they've been around the ropes, they've been through coups, they've been, not through, through coups, but they've been through a number of years. When, when the guy was telling them, hey, you need to form a union, the one older gentleman got up and said, there's no way, this is a trick. Anytime any factory has ever heard that a union's forming, we all lost our jobs, I don't believe it. And the guy's like, no. You guys are committed to this. It's, this is what it means. And he sat down, and then the next guy said the exact same thing. And so when Freo got up, he was saying, no, we are committed. You, like our boss, like the white man, he's pointing to me, obviously, <laughs> is like, and, and us, and management is committed to you guys being fair trade certified and being allowed to form a union. And this is your right. You deserve this. And it was at that moment that everybody started to clap because that wasn't something that they were used to. So for me, that was an important moment where no matter how small or big we are, uh, Natalia, is it? Yeah, no matter how small or big we are, allows us to ensure that those moments stay true to the history of the company. Now, I can't control what happens in the future, but for as long as I'm here, I hope that those moments continue to rise within, within our ranks. All right, what about this side of the room? Get some love over here. Questions? <laughs> How's it going, Tal? Hi. Uh, my name's Cal. Hi, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah, um, thanks for being here. Great, great talk. Um, so your, it seems like your main motive in the initial idea of your business was to create jobs for that man that said, how can I compete with free? Yes? You, you chose shoes because he was already selling shoes? No, so I started looking and saying, hey, what could I build in Africa here that could compete with Chinese imports? So I started thinking, and I got down to apparel and clothing and shoes. And so when I started looking at it, I looked at t-shirts and saying, I just thought it was hyper competitive. It's not that it's not, e it's not easy to sell t-shirts, but it's very easy to make t-shirts. It's just cloth. So I wanted to find something that needed more machinery that was a little bit more pieces. So for me, and I needed something where the raw materials could actually be based for the most part in sub-Saharan Africa. So shoes checked off a lot of that and it gave me a moat, you know, as Warren Buffett says, it gave me a little bit of a moat because the it was there was a little bit more machine and, and hand handcraftedness that needed to be part of it. So that's why I chose shoes. Wonderful, thank you. I think there was a question back there or somewhere. Yeah, we'll do one more. Who wants it? Back here in the back. This is why I wear oh, sneakers sorry, did somebody today. get denied? Uh, you know, so you guys can always email me at tal at liberté.com. I'll probably not answer, but you're more, <laughs> you're more than welcome to email me. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I was just going to ask, and I hear this from a lot of um, young entrepreneurs with investors and stuff. How do you even go about finding investors? If, you know, I started a business tomorrow. Like, If you can't invest in your, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, who's going to invest in you? Now, you're always going to hear about... Toms that grew insane, or you always hear about these overnight stories, and when you actually take apart their layers, they're a 40-year story overnight, and I was talking with Benton about that last night. There's very few true overnight successes. So a lot of the investors, if you don't believe in yourself, how are they gonna believe in you? And so the number one person you should be raising capital from, in my opinion, is yourself. And if that means you need to leverage your home, your line of credits, your assets, whatever it is, it's you. You are your best, you are your best supporter. And if you can't believe in yourself or scratch up some money, it's gonna be hard to convince others. Two, it's very hard to ask family and friends for money, but they are an important part of your, because if you can't convince your own family to invest in you, again, how do you convince? And so I, it's not the path for everybody and not everybody has those resources and I didn't as well. Uh, my parents still think this is the dumbest idea ever. Uh, they love me to death, but 
this is, this is not what they thought I did an MBA for and spent all this money on school for was to go, uh, you know, make, uh, make leather in the jungle, right? Like as they, <laughs> so, and there's no jungle in Ethiopia, so that's the funny part too. Um, but once you've been able to do that, or if not, you just, and, and, I, and I made the joke earlier, it was obviously a little crude, but the idea is you need to go to as many places as you can. I have been on Dragon's Den, which is like Shark Tank here. I have been to social, you see everyone thought because I'm a social business, I would find social on, it's actually the hardest place for me to find investors are these social groups because I don't check off any boxes. I'm not healthcare, I'm not renewable energy, I'm creating jobs. And when you say creating jobs, it's very hard for someone to visually understand what that means. And so even when I built MBAs Without Borders, we always had trouble raising capital or chair, uh, donations because creating jobs is something that people don't actually get. They know we need it, but they don't understand, like Tom's was great, and, and, I, and I, yeah, I, you know, I make fun of them sometimes, but Tom's is great because they gave people a, wait a minute, I buy a shoe, I give a shoe, I get it. I'm like, I'm creating jobs. Like, well, I don't get it. How much do the workers get paid? You know, what do they do on the weekends? What kind of leather do you use? Are your cows, uh, do they have Ebola? Like, I get, I get the weirdest questions. But Tom's like, so if you can keep your model simple and understandable, it's obviously a lot easier. Um, and at some point, you have to continue to believe in yourself, never give up. You, there are shark loans out there, like I said. You just gotta keep going. Eventually, um, one of the things I always say is, outside of what we say in terms of you know today for tomorrow, is everyone says these businesses are just lucky. They got the right celebrity or they got the luck. The longer you stick around, the luckier you get. Figure out how to stick around. That's what I'd say. That's great. And make sure you stick around Creative Mornings for more wisdom like that. Man. Give it up for Tao.